Good morning, everybody. Hope you're all well. Welcome to Breakthrough City Church on a glorious sunny morning. I'm broadcasting from Clarence. It's uh, the long weekend in South Africa, and um, we've taken the gap and gone to be with family. Two grandchildren have birthdays either side of the weekend, so what a what an opportunity to celebrate. So we had a, a lovely braai uh, yesterday, and <laughs> I'm looking forward to a brunch this morning, which will help my belly no end, as you can imagine. So I hope and trust you are enjoying the weekend, as we are, and um, also looking forward to Tuesday night, to our encounter night, and hope you'll be able to join, uh, join us there. So uh, this morning, I'm in, uh, in Habakkuk, and uh, I'm just going to pray for us. And uh, <coughs> somebody shared a, a picture of, um, of the light coming through God's word this morning. And so I pray that, that your heart would be ready to receive his light, his enduring light that uh, the light would come into your heart and that you would be filled uh, with joy and peace and hope uh, coming out of this, this word this morning. Lord Jesus, please speak to us. Please encourage and challenge and bless us through your word this morning, in Jesus' name. So as I said, I'm in, in Habakkuk. And that's in the Old Testament, and Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets, and, <laughs> and it makes me giggle uh, when I think about, you know, <laughs> fancy being called a minor prophet, uh, or a minor anything. I mean, how, how does that help, uh, help you? But he's called a minor prophet because he only has three chapters in his, uh, in his story, in, his, uh, in the book that he wrote. Uh, and people like Jeremiah with 52 chapters and Isaiah with 66 chapters, bigger books, more to say, uh, more messages. But it doesn't mean to say that the message in Habakkuk is any less important. Uh, it's just there's less words. <laughs> Which, seen as we're looking at the whole book this morning, is, is good for us. So the message is not minor, even though the prophet maybe and um, the book is called an oracle and an oracle is a message or even the the person giving the message and uh, and it's often refers to a message from God or a, a messenger from God so this is this is what the book is about it's about bringing a message to us from from God's heart and um, as I say, it's only three chapters long, and um, it's towards the end of the Old Testament. If you're, if you've got a paper Bible, uh, sort of five books in from the end, and uh, <clears throat> it's a message about a conversation that he had in prayer with God, and he was he was frustrated with the circumstances around uh, his nation, the nation of Judah, uh, <clears throat> and he. He was praying and seeking God for his people. And, uh, <clears throat> but it's also, it's in the Bible. So it's for us as well. We, we can draw encouragement uh, and learning from, from this word. So Habakkuk lived in uh, the southern kingdom when the kingdom split, Israel split into two. Judah was the southern kingdom with Jerusalem as the capital. And, uh, and they stayed truer to, to God for longer than the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom co quickly collapsed into idol worship. Uh, but by the time Habakkuk is having this conversation with God, the same was true of the southern king kingdom. Most people had fallen into, into idol worship. And uh, in the conversation with God, Habakkuk has two uh, complaints. Uh, complaints against God nonetheless and so I'm going to start with each of these complaints and then God's answer what did God have to say to Habakkuk in in response to his complaints 
So first, first lesson from this then, it's okay to complain to God because it's in his Bible. So Habakkuk's first complaint then, uh, verse 2 of chapter 1, and he's moaning um, about God not answering his prayers. So he's obviously, he's a man of prayer and he's been praying for his nation and he feels that God hasn't, hasn't yet answered his prayers and he's expressing frustration. And as I've said, the people, people of God, they're in a mess. Uh, and, and Habakkuk has some things to say about his own people, uh, which I'm just going to, to list for you uh, rather than read, read the whole chapter. Um, this is what was going on in Judah in his time among God's people. These were God's people. So he lists violence, injustice, wrongdoing, destruction, strife, conflict, wickedness, the law being paralyzed, the law being, you know, what the people of God were supposed to be up to, and justice being perverted. And yet the <laughs> the main thing that was going on, he, he doesn't even speak about. So he lists all these wrongs that are going on in, in the nation, but the thing that was going wrong, which he doesn't mention, was in the heart of the people. And he doesn't mention idol worship. He doesn't mention child sacrifice. Uh, maybe Habakkuk he couldn't bear to, to be that, that open. Uh, couldn't bear to mention these unmentionable things that were going on in and among God's people. Jeremiah, on the other hand, <laughs> he, has, he has more to say about this. And we jump quickly to Jeremiah 32 and 35. He, <clears throat> this is what he says about uh, the, the nation, the people, God's people. They built high places for Baal in the valley of ben Hindam to sacrifice their sons and daughters to Molech. Although I never commanded nor did it enter my mind, this is God speaking through the prophet, that they should do such a detestable thing and so make Judah sin. So God is revolted by the practices of his own people. Uh, and Hezekiah's, um, Habakkuk, sorry, is calling out to God to intervene and uh, and he accuses God he says you're not listening you're not saving you're tolerating all this wrongdoing and and he then asks and how long how long must I call for your help how long must I pray before you answer me Habakkuk wants God to intervene and to bring about a transformation for the people of of God you know, there's a history here. The Old Testament is full of stories of the people messing up and God intervening and the people repenting and then the people messing up again and God intervening and the people repenting. So this is what Habakkuk has in mind. God, you, you must save your people from themselves. And, and God has an answer. He has a plan, as is always the case. Uh, and from verses... Uh, 5 to 11 of, of chapter 1, you see God's plan mapped out. <laughs> He's basically saying, I see your evil, and don't worry, I have a plan. I'm sending the Babylonians, <laughs> also called the Chaldeans, to sort you lot out. And I'm sure uh, Habakkuk was like, serious? And then God... He gives a similar list. You know, <clears throat> Habakkuk has listed the sins of uh, God's people. And then God replies with, yeah, I've got these people. They're coming. This is who they are. They are bitter, hasty, ruthless, impetuous, sweeping across the world, seizing what's not theirs, feared, dreaded, a law unto themselves, promoting their own honor. Their horses swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves, flying like eagles, swooping to devour, intent 
on violence. They are hordes, advancing like the wind, taking prisoners like sand, mocking kings, scoffing at rulers, laughing at fortified cities, building earthen ramps to capture them, a guilty people. Their strength is their God. <laughs> so this is God's comment on his other chosen people. There's the chosen people of God, and then there's the other people that God has chosen to deal with the chosen people of God. No character before anointing here. God was looking for the biggest bunch of badass bruisers he could find, and they were the Babylonians. They were to deal with the idol worship of Judah. Their own idol was themselves, their strength, their God. Are you sure this is a good idea, Lord? A bunch of idol worshippers to deal with a bunch of idol worshippers. And this, needless to say, resulted in Habakkuk's second complaint. I can imagine Habakkuk going, Serious? Are you sure? He must have had a bit of a hissy fit you know, on the quiet at God's answer. But they're worse than us, he must have thought. And then he doesn't pull any punches in his complaint to God. Chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. You are using them for judgment and reproof? An accus accusation rather than a statement. You know, he's saying to God, them? Sure, surely not them. Surely somebody else. You know, anybody but them. We are more righteous. Yet you using them to swallow us up? We are like fish in their net. They are mercilessly killing nations forever. He's moaning about the medicine, about God's plan, without really focusing yet on the cure, on what, how is God going to use these people. But having spent most of chapter one ranting at God, he takes a breath. And at the beginning of chapter two, the tone changes. He's basically saying, okay, I'm going to pray about this and I'm going to wait on God. So uh, verse 2 of chapter 2. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. And then God answers him. And it wasn't now, okay, hmm, yeah, okay, scrap the Babylonians, I'll send you another prophet. Maybe, you know, if I send another prophet, my people will repent. No, no, his answer is, they're coming. <laughs> but don't worry, when they've dealt with you, I will deal with them. <laughs> I'm sure that wasn't the answer that Habakkuk was looking for. He was like, he must have been, oh no. And um, in his chapter, in chapter 2, verses 2 to 20, God says to Habakkuk, write the vision down for his people. He's basically saying judgment is coming. I'm going to use this aggressive nation to deal with your sin. God also says the righteous live by faith, <clears throat> implying that the people of Judah were not at all righteous. But there's a clue there for us uh, and obviously for them that yeah, the key here is righteousness, is faith. The, the key for the transformation of the nation of Israel does come from inside, although God is going to use this other nation uh, to, to instigate this. What is going to change God's people is a heart thing. It's faith. God then <laughs> gives, gives him another list about the Babylonians, an encouraging one. Yeah? They are heaping up what is not theirs. They have plundered many nations. They have got evil gain for their houses and cut off many people. So the people will rise up. 
The remnant will plunder them, for they have forfeited their lives. In verse 12, it says, Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. So although he's using Babylon, you know, Babylon have their own problems uh, and their own need for repentance. Pointing back at his people, he changes tack and he asks, what in verse 18, what prophet is an idol? Can it awake? Can it speak? Can it teach? He's, he's basically saying, you've chosen idol worship and now you're asking me for help? <laughs> But there's something else going on here that we need to see. Why? Why the Babylonians? Why did God choose the Babylonians? God didn't cause the Babylonians to be evil, uh, to be these sort of power seekers. But he did use their lust for warfare and for world domination as a way to reach and teach his own people, the very people he loved, the very people he had established. You see, back in chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, they gather captives like sand. So God chose the Babylonians because they didn't murder and wipe out those that they conquered. They took prisoners. <laughs> Unusual in this, this season, this time, this, this point in history. Most people... Israelites included, wiped out those that they conquered. Yet the Babylonians had a different way of, of conquering. They took prisoners. God's people would survive this because God did not want to destroy his people, but teach them because of his plan, his plan from the beginning. In chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I don't know if you've ever flown over the sea um, before, but it seemingly it goes on forever. You can't see the shore that you're heading for and you can't see the shore that you've left behind. All you see is this expanse of water. And that remains God's plan for his people, that they would be like the waters covering the sea. God's plan remained his people, filled with the knowledge of his glory, filling the earth, as it was back in uh, Genesis 1 and verse 28, and as it is to this day um, in Acts 28 and 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. How could God's people achieve this if they were to be wiped out? There was a remnant who were going to remain, and they were going to remain true to God. And they may not be in Israel, they were taken to uh, Babylon, that's where the Rivers of Babylon song uh, comes from. But they were going to rebuild uh, and they were going to establish Israel uh, and then Jesus was going to come. So what does Habakkuk do in the light of all this? <laughs> well, he prays. <laughs> he prays to God. Well done, Habakkuk, uh, that we would all do, do this. So chapter 3 starts with him praying. <clears throat> and in verse 2 we see, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Lord, repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In rough, remember mercy. So recognizing, despite his complaints, that, that God knows best, <laughs> he prays that God would come again in his day. He's asking God to bring his presence, to bring deliverance, to bring revival, to bring restoration. That's, that's the heart of Habakkuk for his people. 
let us, let us be Habakkuk for this generation. Let us pray Habakkuk's prayer for our generation, for our nations. Repeat your, your fame, your deeds in our day, Lord. And then <clears throat> most of the rest of, of chapter three of his prayer is worship. It's thanking God for what he's about to do. <clears throat> I mean, he's about to do Firstly, he's going to invade the country and then he's going to take all the captives somewhere else and then he will let them come back 70 years later. So um, <laughs> he's praying for a future history that he doesn't yet see. But God has spoken, God has said what is going to happen. But in verse 17, this, his prayer changes from one of thanking God for what is about to happen. And I just want to read this. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, although the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. So he's, he's listened to God He's heard the plan. He doesn't like the plan, but he recognizes God knows best. And he says, regardless of my circumstances, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to rejoice in you. <laughs> I love you. And, and, and what a beautiful place for the story, the oracle to finish with all this threat, uh, with all this sin, with all this filth uh, between these two nations that he would finish with, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in God my Saviour. And I want to <clears throat> step out of the story, if you like, and jump forward to today and to you and me. And I want to ask, what does the, this book teach us today you see despite all that was going on in his world God remained Habakkuk's saviour and he remains our saviour and regardless of our current circumstances and maybe maybe our circumstance is our idol maybe that's the thing that's getting in our way will will you and I worship him despite our circumstances in the way Habakkuk was. <clears throat> I would like to, to suggest that there are two evils at work in this book, and they're repeated in our lives today. They, um, they seek to hinder or block our worship. And it's the evil within and the evil without. And so let's look at the evil within first. So the people of God the equivalent to the Christians of the day were worshipping idols which required child sacrifice. Uh, and God, God had compassion on them still. His heart burned for them as it burns for us. He loves his people. And there are, there are so, so many warnings in the Old Testament uh, that had come and gone, including this one from Habakkuk. But still, his people are caught up in worshipping idols. And because of that, that results in injustice, the sacrifice of children. And he's jealous or zealous for relationship with us. And he hates injustice. And, and how? How do those things? He loves us and he hates injustice. And how do those things, how does that come together? We learn, Genesis 1 and verse 17, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. And in Micah 6 and verse 8, he has shown you, O mortal, me and you, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy 
and to walk humbly with your God. <laughs> There's a formula, if you like, and hey, I'm careful with formulas in, in the word of God. It's a, it's a heart thing. But this is what he's looking for. He says, I love you. Please, please do this. Please be this. Please act justly. Please love mercy. Please walk humbly before me. So what, get, what gets in the way of that today? What idols can we worship today? Well, obviously they remain the same, but they're different. So <clears throat> there's money, there's sex, there's power, there's politics, there's self, the modern idol, me, myself and I. There's our circumstances or, or comfort. You know, I'd love to do that, but what about my bond? Uh, what about the interest on my car loan? What about my children's education? What about my health? There's the culture then, and yeah, you know, there's culture has many things, many meanings. There's the culture that we follow from our forebears. And how does that fit into God's plan and God's questions and God's asks? But there's also the, the hip and happening culture of today. That, that can, the fashion, the music, um, you know, please dress yourselves and listen to music. It's not what I'm saying, but we can get caught up. We can get bonded to these things. What about religion? Yeah, the way we do things. How about righteousness itself? We can be so fixated on our own righteousness, or other people's unrighteousness, that we lose the heart. We lose who God is. And in worshipping these things, we undermine, we discriminate, we oppress others. So two examples, and the first one is a biggie. <clears throat> and um, I wondered whether to include it, but I feel I have to. And this is, this is abortion. More people die from abortion than any other cause of death, particularly in the Western world. And what is it? If it's not for medical reasons, it's not uh, because harm will come. It's, it's a form of idol worship. My life, my comfort, my fears, my insecurities are more important than this helpless child that's, that's alive inside me. And I'm, I'm, I'm deeply, I'm gutted that I would have to say that in that way. Uh, and please, you know, if you've had an abortion, God, <laughs> he still loves you in the same way that he loves the people of Israel and Judah who messed up. But he wants you to recognize that that was an injustice for the unborn child. And his heart broke for you in making that decision and his heart broke for the child that, that was lost to you. And then, as I said, the religion. Um, I had a friend back in the UK and uh, we did, well, I had a few friends, <laughs> but we did an alpha course together and um, she loved all the ritual and the 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 way the service was conducted, the the robes and the incense and, and the little nice rails in the church and the kneeling and everything around the high Anglican uh, church services. And, and that was so important to her that it was preventing her own salvation. She was putting these religious practices ahead of what God was saying in his word about wanting a relationship, about wanting to love her, about a personal uh, knowing of God. And it was preventing her, her own salvation. But it was also the way her church, you know, she wanted to encourage people to come to her church and to do things her way, uh, which was a barrier for some. I mean, some 
you know, may well appreciate and, and, and receive God's heart through these. But for others, you know, it was, it was a dead thing. There was no life in it. And praise God, her eyes were opened. Uh, and she became born again and spirit filled and grow to love the wider body, uh, the Church of Christ. So those are things going on inside us that, um, that God wants to deal with. As I say, there's a whole list of things there and it's about your heart. You're worshipping an idol is putting something before God. So what do we put before God? What is more important to us than than following the word of God. Um, and and you, you need to look inside and you need to test your own heart in these things. I can't say to you, you had an abortion and that was wrong. Because only you know the circumstances of that. Only you know how that came about. Only you know what motivated you. And I can ask you to ask questions of God about that. And that's all I can do. I mustn't judge you. I mustn't uh, reject you because that's what happened. I must love you and I must teach you who God is so that you know his love and you know peace with him. So that's the evil within. That's our own hearts. And then this book talks about the evil without the Babylonians, if you like. They were brutal. They were proud and they expected to be around forever. And, and in a sense, um, they're still with us. We first hear about them in uh, the book of Genesis. They were the guys busy building the Tower of Babel, or their ancestors anyway. Um, that was the area that Babel was. And God had to disperse many people and confuse many people because of the, the power of this people. They were wanting to become mini gods, if you like. And then we see them through the Old Testament, but they're also in, in, uh, in Revelation, right at the end of the Bible, as Babylon, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes. Um, so in the Old Testament, they were a people, a nation. And in the New Testament, they're a spirit or a political type, a controlling, manipulating, powerful presence among us that is opposed to God and opposed to his church. Babylon the Great, in the, in the book of Revelation, she despised, hated, and wanted to destroy the people of God. And... Um, and we see in history examples. So Rome in Jesus' day was a type of Babylon. Uh, and modern day governments can be a type of, of Babylon, including democratically elected governments. And then there are evil institutions uh, that are um, perpetuating lies and deceiving people into, into a way of life or um, an approach that is not God's way. There are controlling and manipulating forces and they're all opposed to God and because of that to, to his church. And when we stand for uh, a principle of life, uh, something we feel God says, that we must live out, then we get kicked back. Um, and in today's uh, society, then a lot of um, the abuse, the, the stuff, there's something behind it. There's a, an evil presence. There's a controlling force. So things like child abuse, um, rape, gender-based violence in general, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a demonic spirit behind that. And people get caught up and trapped in um, 
I'm now being watched by my two grandsons <laughs> through the window. <clears throat> so if I'm distracted, then that's because they're looking very, very uh, ready for the day, ready, ready for action. And um, they, there's a, there's a, there's something more than just somebody uh, being violent or aggressive or what have you. There's a, there's a spirit behind it that's manipulating. Not that these people aren't responsible, they are responsible, but uh, they, they're caught up in something bigger than themselves, something destructive, if you like. And, um, and the, another one, politics, as I've mentioned, governments and institutions. There's no one political party that is kingdom focused. Um, even some of those that would claim to be are, are less than, let's put it that way, less than kingdom focused. So while we can vote, and I would encourage voting, and we vote with our conscience as Christians, we can't, we can't give our heart or our undivided loyalty to one party. Uh, and neither can we hate or despise another party that might be uh, opposed uh, to some of the things that are important to us. But this morning, I'm not preaching from the Beatitudes. <laughs> um, I'm not preaching about loving your enemy. Um, but I just want to say, yeah, guys, as, as we present what we believe to the world, we are to be a shining light. We are to be salt. And in reading some, some things that Christians post in the media, I sometimes wonder, have they even found the Beatitudes? It's not who God called us to be. It's Pharisaic. Um, to, to come across harshly in these areas, to hate. We hate sin. We love the sinner. Anyway, to summarize Habakkuk, Habakkuk was a guy who wanted the best for his nation. He wanted his people to rise up in the purposes of God. And he was troubled. And he was struggling um, with faith, with his own faith, in the light of, of what the nation faced. And, and yet, by questioning God and through a process of prayer, he comes back to the joy of his salvation. Yeah? It's okay to complain to God. And it's okay to pray. I don't pray. I don't understand this, God. What are you doing here? Why is this happening? Those are fine prayers. They lead you to recognize who God is and to rejoice. And in his day, they battled with the same temptations and worldly demonic forces. Um, some of whom God was using to send a message. They battled with them. And today, we battle with our own temptations and worldly demonic forces. And again, sometimes God is using them to send us a message. Sometimes we're busy, so busy rebuking Satan for something that we're not listening to God. And so we need to get a balance. We need to understand Sometimes these things, bad things happen to good people because God is trying to say hello. And so what is he saying to you and to, to I? Our problems remain the same. They may look slightly different, but they remain at our own hearts, the evil within, and, and society as a whole, the evil without. And in Mark 7 and verse 6, Jesus quotes Isaiah 29 uh, and verse 13. And he says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. 
So let's go back to what God is saying. What is he saying to you, to me? Sometimes he will send you a problem as a lesson, as a way of, of teaching. And sometimes we're so busy trying to deal with the problem in our own strength that we don't do what Habakkuk did. He sort of stepped back and he reflected. What, what is God saying to me? in this time and that's my prayer for each one of us this morning that we would step back and we would look into the light the endearing uh, enduring light of father god and we would hear what he is saying to us about our own hearts and about how we're to respond to the world around us to finish then chapter 3 and verse 18, Habakkuk said, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Can you say that this morning? Is that where your heart is this morning? Is he your God? Have you become his child? Is he your Lord? Are you following him? Have, have you turned away from these internal evils? Are you alive? In him are you born again are you spirit filled you see the people of God in the Old Testament were never able to overcome these idols that's why God sent Jesus that's why it says here even Habakkuk said the righteous can only live by faith and that faith is in Jesus So God's message this morning is rekindle your faith if circumstances have troubled it. His message to you this morning is my faith is available to you. To you. I'm here for you. I'm reaching out. I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door to me we can have fellowship you can become my child i can become your father so let's pray let's pray that we would know the joy of our salvation <laughs> again anyone who's lost that joy anyone who never received salvation there's a moment here for you please take a moment even today maybe with a pen and paper, uh, and, and break down these things. What are the things in your heart that are tempting you, that are blocking you? Uh, and what forces are coming against you from the outside? What is, what is the message that God is bringing to you in this season? And, and do this for yourself, for your spouse, for your children, for your church your workplace, your business, your community, your nation. What, what forces uh, do we need to love out of the way, if you like? And then make a decision for Jesus. Yeah? Make a decision uh, to put him first, to lay down these, these idols, these, these things, these things that are consuming you. Repent of what you need to repent of stand against what you need to stand against and flee what you need to flee that we might be the light to this nation and to whichever nation you are in this morning and that we might know the joy of our salvation in Jesus name Amen so may the Lord bless your week may you have a, a fantastic week uh, I hope to see those of you that are in Bloemfontein on Tuesday night. Candice will send us more information uh, about timing. It's at her place. Uh, bless you and may the Lord keep you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.